morning everyone. My name is Shima Salmasi and I'm from University College London. Thank you for being here and I'm here to talk to you about my PhD project which is on uh, design and development of a nanohydroxyapatite post-PCU nanocomposite biomaterial for the applications in bone tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. Excuse us for the long word but it's called post-PCU that may be just stick to your mind better. Um, so, on the normal setting and to some extent, natural bone can actually repair and regenerate itself, but it consists of a very um, complicated structure which is made out of nanohydroxyapatite, type 1 collagen and water. But it is actually the large bone defects that are considered as a major problem for the clinicians and the society because they, those ones, they don't have the capacity to regenerate or repair, repair the, themselves as we expect them to. Now, the commonly available treatment options include autografts and allografts, and the advantages of the autografts, as you probably all know, is, the, is that they are live cells and tissues, they have no risk of disease transmissions, and they have low risk of graft rejection. However, their disadvantages is that they have limitations in donor site, requirement of a secondary operation, and that they have availability of a smaller graft size. Allografts, on the other hand, they have um, advantages of avoiding donor site morbidity, um, reduced surgical time, and also that they have um, availability of larger graft size compared to the autografts. Now, um, there, they have um, a few disadvantages, and that include that there are dead tissue versus the um, uh, autografts. They have risk of disease transmission such as HIV because they're not actually from the patient's own body and also because they have limitations in terms of availability and also they're highly costly. Now, the next generation of treatment options uh, include reconstruction of bone with fully synthetic um, artificial bone grafts. Um, in order to, to better mimic the micro structure and the, the mineral, the, the micro and the nanostructure, and also the uh, mineral components of the natural bone, various um, synthetic biomaterials such as nanohydroxyapatite have been investigated. Um, nanohydroxyapatite, in particular, has been of a um, interest for the scientists, uh, and that's probably because it's the main inorganic component of the natural bone. Um, it has been established that it has excellent biocompatibility, osteoconductivity, and also bone integration ability. And you have heard a lot about how it is important for, the, uh, for orthopedic implants to actually integrate with, um, uh, with, the, uh, with the bone of the host. Um, and that was all um, discussed today. But the most problem with these material is that, um, that they, their clinical applications are limited because they have low mechanical strength, um, they are quite brittle and they have uh, quite a um, large number of fatigue failure. But these limitations can be actually overcome by incorporating nanohydroxyapatite into polymeric scaffolds. And what I'm actually offering here today to you is POSPCU, which is a, um, a nanocomposite design by covalently bonding the hard segment of, piece, uh, of POS uh, which is a type of um, salsa, salsa quine oxine uh, molecule uh, uh, to the soft segment of PCL. Both PAS and PCL have been used in the research for many, many years, but by actually combining these two polymers together we, uh, at our research center, we have developed a, a novel polymer that, that is the um, POS-PCU, and which has an, uh, in, compared to PAS and PCU on their own, it has enhanced biocompatibility, uh, superior mechanical properties, and also augmented uh, degradative resistance. Now, our extensive in vitro studies have shown that by incorporating PAS and PCU together, what is actually happening is that PAS is protecting PCU from actually becoming degraded by agents such as oxides or hydrolates. Now, our research team um, together, we have uh, done various studies on post-PCU. We have um, developed um, stents, we have heart valves, ear reconstruction, but most notably, we have done uh, a, few uh, a few cases of first in human, and that was one was the uh, arterial bypass graft, uh, the lacrimal duct, and probably most notably, the, uh, the first synthetic trachea in human. 
Um, but the overview of my project in particular actually involves the design and development of a new biomaterial uh, consisting of nanohydroxyapatite and possibly CU nanocomposite for non-load-bearing bone tissue engineering applications. And that could include from anything such as coating of orthopedic prosthetics, scaffolding for um, guided bone regeneration, and also um, as bone graft substitutes. Now for this, I have actually incorporated nanohydroxyapatite nanoparticles of less than 200 nanometers in size, with post-BCU at 10, 30, and 50% of the weight volume of the solid polymer. Once I actually prepared the solution, uh, the polymeric solution out of the nanohydroxyapatite and post-BCU, I actually used the um, well-known casting fabrication technique and I fabricated um, scaffolds of a, approximately 300 microns for my um, physiochemical in vitro um, studies. Now, uh, for the purpose of uh, comparison, I used pure post-BCU nanocomposite scaffolds and, and also Thermonex cover slips as positive controls were applicable in my studies. Now, um, there has been a lot of uh, mentions today that it's very important for in the scaffold to be both um, sort of uh, mechanically stable uh, for a um, bone tissue engineering application and also to be acting as a good scaffolding for cells that are being actually seeded on it. So my first aim became to actually investigate these uh, nanocomposite scaffolds in terms of their physiochemical properties. And what I did was I measured their mechanical properties using instrument. And what I found was that by incorporating 50% nanohydroxyapatite compared to the control, 10 and 30%, I actually increased the Young's modulus of uh, my scaffolds. Uh, but its maximum tensile strength and elongation at uh, break were significantly lower. But uh, mechanical uh, properties are quite important because if there is a mismatch between the natural bone and the um, uh, scaffolding, there is a high risk of actually implant failure uh, when uh, placed in vivo or in, or in human. Um, I also looked at the surface stiffness of my scaffolds using atomic force microscopy, and I found that the, by incorporating 50% nanohydroxyapatite, I could actually increase the stiffness of my surface quite significantly compared to the others. Now, surface stiffness is quite important because it has direct impact on the cell attachment, proliferation, and also differentiation of cells on a particular scaffold. I also measured the contact angle using Cecil drop me method, and that was because my scaffolds were non-porous. And it, it showed me that post-BCU 10% and 30% nanohydroxyapatite post-BCU nanocomposites were all highly hydrophobic. Whereas when you incorporate 50% nanohydroxyapatite, you actually uh, can see a statistically significant change towards hydrophilicity. That is quite important because um, hydrophilicity is normally what you would actually prefer in terms of cell attachment and growth. Um, again, surface chemistry affects protein absorption and consequently cell behavior, so that, was, um, uh, that, that is quite important to be investigated. And um, the, uh, the change towards hydrophilicity was quite similar to that of Thermonix as my control. Um, what I also did was I measured surface topography using atomic force microscopy, and it showed me that by incorporating 50% nanohydroxyapatite, my surface changed from um, post-BCU, which sort of had a flat um, topography, to a very rough and um, to a um, rougher surface uh, with um, much more nanotopography. And um, so, as you can see, sort of the um, uh, compared to Thermonix, which is just a cover slip in plastic, basically, it actually moved to slight nanotopography and into a very high level of uh, surface roughness. Surface roughness is very important because it actually affects the uh, distribution of the amount of proteins that are being absorbed on the surface of the scaffold and consequently the cell behavior on um, and, and the um, uh, investigation uh, and the scaffolds that are being investigated. Now, once I figured out how probably my scaffolds will behave in terms of physiochemical properties, I was very interested to actually investigate my um, scaffolds in terms of in vitro um, cell cellular behavior. So 
I chose sarcomerosogenic SAO stu cells, and that was because they have um, they're quite available worldwide. They have well documented characterization data, and for the fact that they can be fully differentiated in a manner that osteoblastic um, cells naturally do in human. Now, for this purpose, cells were expanded in macroglutamax media and then cultured in osteogenic media containing uh, beta glycer phosphate, elascorbic acid, and dexamethasone. Now, uh, during my cell culture per period, I looked at cell adhesion and cell proliferation using uh, alamal blue and total DNA, and then calcium deposition using uh, alkaline phosphate as activity assay and then bone nodule formation using alizinone red staining. And finally, I looked at the cell morphology using a scanning electron microscopy. Uh, the Alamo Blue and Total DNA uh, confirmed that there was uh, the metabolic activity and total number of adhered cells in increased amongst all of the scaffolds between uh, 6 hours and 24 hours. However, the 50% nanohydroxyapatite uh, post-PCU nanocomposite showed the highest um, metabolic activity and total number of adhered cells at the end of the 24 hours compared to the other scaffolds. Um, there was also um, evidence that the metabolic activity and total number of seeded cells increased significantly on all of the scaffolds between day one and day 14, followed by a significant decrease at day 21. That's where they probably the scaffolds became um, confluent and you would normally see that sort of in decrease um, in cell culturing. But what was interesting was that compared to 50% uh, nano HA and uh, post PCU, every other scaffold had, had less um, um, metabolic activity and total number of adhered cells. So th that 50% nanohydroxyapatite was doing something. And then um, to confirm that, I measured the rate of proliferation of SAO2 cells, and it actually showed significant increase for 50% nanohydroxyapatite post PCU nanocomposites compared to the other scaffolds at all time points. So basically, the rate of proliferation was much higher than the 50%. <clears throat> Um, I looked at al uh, ALP activity or alkaline phosphatase uh, because the, uh, it is actually expressed early during bone development and then later during the uh, differentiation sequence program. It, it, uh, other genes such as osteocalcin are uh, upregulated and ALP expression declines. Now, in, um, in case of my scaffolds, what I s saw was that there was an increase of ALP activity per microgram of DNA. Uh, at between day one and day 14, followed by a statistically significant decrease from day one, uh, from day 14 to day 21. Now that is again what, what we would expect, an increase of ALP and then decrease why the bone development is actually uh, progressing and other genes are becoming upregulated. But what was again interesting to see was that with 50% nano HA, the um, ALP activity was much higher at day 14. Um, Alizarin red staining showed me quite interesting results because it actually confirmed bone nodules uh, formation on all of the scaffolds, which you would expect on, on them anyways. But what it showed was that at 50% at 50 the um, um, bone nodules formation density was much higher compared to the other scaffolds. You could see a thermonic sort of um, comparable with 50%, but compared to 10 and 30 and the post PC itself and the controls with no cells, 50% had much higher uh, bone nodules formed. Uh, finally, for my in vitro study, I looked at the um, uh, SEM imaging at day seven and 14, and it showed um, uh, increased SAO2 spreading and uh, proliferation on the 50% nanohydroxyapatite um, scaffolds uh, compared to the other scaffolds, both at day seven and in particular day 14. That is nice results, but what was very much for me interesting was the crystal needle shape calcium phosphate depositions on cells attached to the 50% and not on the other scaffolds. So those are the things that you would really want to see developed um, as the bone is becoming to regenerate itself, and uh, not itself, like regenerate. Now, um, for my, th my third aim, I actually investigated the exposure of nanohydroxyapatite on the surface of post PCU nanocomposite. What I really wanted to know was that whether polymer is actually encapsulating these 
nano um, material or is it actually allowing it to be exposed on the surface and therefore to the neighboring environment and the cells around it. So for this I use post-PCU and 50% nano hydroxyapatite post-PCU scaffolds and I immerse them into 1.5 times simulated body fluid solution or SPF. Uh, and that was for 3, 10 and 28 um, days. And that allowed me to investigate appetite layer formation on their surfaces. Now simulated body fluid solution study was chosen because SPF is a um, solution with an iron concentration uh, close to that of human blood plasma. Now for this, I looked at the surface chemical, <coughs> excuse me, functional groups and also appetite layer formation using ATR, FDIR and um, SEM. Now, uh, what I saw was that when I did the ATR, FDIR on the um, um, SPF solutions, and there were uh, um, phosphate groups and calcium uh, and carbonate groups uh, presented on the 50%, as you can see them in the red box, but not on the control without the nanohydroxy appetite. But SEM unfortunately did ensure any um, appetite layer formation, much difference um, between the two samples, so it actually requires further investigation. Um, in conclusion, I should say that um, what I found was that 50% is the optimum ratio for um, nanohydroxy appetite to be incorporated with post-PCU uh, because it showed the most uh, favorable uh, outcome in terms of uh, material and cell interaction and also osteoinductive properties for bone deposition and regeneration. But my, before I actually conclude my PhD, I, I plan to do further investigations most in terms of um, nanohydroxy appetite exposure to the surface uh, using uh, various techniques such as Raman, XRD and ICP. Um, and then also by uh, optimizing my 50%, which showed the best in vitro results and physiochemical results, and take it further by actually um, bringing in nanotopography um, uh, into the scaffold. So I plan to etch my surfaces and further expose the nanohydroxy appetite and then seed them with mesenchymal stem cells. And that is because um, in literature it has been shown that nanotopography can actually help uh, MSCs to grow better and to uh, further differentiate the bone. And lastly, I would like to introduce my final and optimized scaffold into a suitable animal model to actually see how these scaffolds would behave in vivo. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Very good <laughs> and very clear presentation. Other questions from the audience? So what kind of uh, technology would you like to test first? Um, do you think your, uh, your virus are comparatively for Raman spectroscopy? They are because they actually come in uh, like a sort of a sheet. Mm -hmm. So they, they can be, it was already done in Raman, but I didn't include it here. And also, uh, what you can do is that you can test ramen on a solution to mm -hmm. see how nanohydroxy appetite has been leached out from the polymer. So when I do the etching of the surface, which I've already done some, um, you can measure how much nanohydroxy appetite is released back into the solvent that you have used, and then measure that using ramen. So maybe we could do some experiments together, sure, because definitely. then we can keep the cells alive. Yeah. I would like to congratulate you okay. and give you the <laughs> your certificate for giving oh, the lecture thank here. You very thank much. you very Thanks much and uh, good luck for your thank further you. research.